I'm going to uh, speak for a moment or two, and then I'll, I'll get everybody to come up to help move stuff. <sighs> All right. Well, we're going to do uh, this panel again tonight. We'll have the Eldridges up and Dr. Crystal up again, and then Dr. Cephas and his wife, Miss Chantel. The Eldridges have been our youth leaders for 11 years. The Ablaquas have been our college and career. Well, Dr. Cephas has been since 2008 or 9. And then Chantel, of course, when she married Dr. Cephas, she kind of married into the college and career ministry. And then Dr. Krista will have up because she's an educator and works at the university. So she sees how the current kids are entering into the university. And university kids are supposed to have their act together pretty well. I mean, you made it to college, right? You're like... That's future parliament right there, right? You know? So she has an enlightening perspective on what today's young people are coming up as. Uh, but I want to say a few things just concerning parenting. I made a few notes. Last week, uh, we had some wonderful things said. And I did look out on you guys, the congregation, and I saw tears. And in that, in that moment, I can't, I can't be concerned about them. I just have to trust the Holy Spirit's doing what he wants to do. So I do want to say that we don't say anything that we say tonight to purposely hurt anybody, though there will be pain. Because we're learning, some of us who are adults are learning, our parents could have done it better. We're learning maybe we were neglected and we didn't need to be. My wife's testimony is she didn't really have parents for a long time. Her parents were drug addicts. She was born illegitimate. She, she tells the kids all the time, I feel pretty good about myself. She says, you have a wonderful daddy. And she reminds the kids, I didn't have a daddy. And so that's a very real thing to her. I don't know if she feels shortchanged by us parenting, realizing, why couldn't I have had this? You, you can't go back and live for a better past. It's never going to happen. But I also understand if this, these kind of lessons are painful because you realize what you lost. The good news is God is here today to redeem the time, heal you, speak to you, fix you, and give the next generation a better foundation. And so we really don't have time to stop and lick our wounds or feel woe is us when we have another generation to pass this baton to. Every generation has to be looking and preparing to pass the baton. Because I pastor long enough, I will bury most of you. And then I will be buried. And this thing called the kingdom and life is a conveyor belt. People are born, we grow up, we find our place in this world, we have kids, we retire, we have grandkids or whatever, and then we get buried and we dirt nap, right? That's what they call it. And then life responds again. So we have to always be looking for our replacement. And we're always going to look back with 2020 vision as a Monday morning quarterback and realize this is what needs to be done better. This is what I would have done better. When I sit down with older ministers who I judge to be humble, because not every older minister is humble, I usually ask them, what did you do wrong? What would you do different? I even asked Dr. Barclay if he would ask Brother Copeland for me, where did you miss it? I, I, this was about six months ago, and Pastor and I haven't tagged up on it. I, I said, um, Pastor, I'd like to hear from the men older than you where they think they've missed it, because every minister is going to look back. I wanted this for my personal information for ministry, and Brother Copeland's the oldest minister still alive who lived through great revivals, and Dr. Barclay's close to him. I want to know, could, could he share something? Would he admit to something and share something? And uh, that way us younger ministers don't have to reinvent the wheel or burn ourselves when we don't need to be. I was asking him about another famous minister who he was close with. I said, where did he think he missed it? And he said, I'll tell you what he would say. Never. Didn't miss a thing. Wouldn't change. I asked the question, what would they change? What would they do differently? That's kind of the polite way of asking the old timers, where'd you go wrong? What would you do differently? You got to know how to phrase it to get a good answer. And he said, I'll tell you what the one brother would say. Nothing. I wouldn't change a thing. And I said, that feels a little pompous to me. Because if you're humble and you're a human, there's a lot of things you would change through trial and error. All right. So in parenting, we're always making adjustments. And so we do these kind of panels or teach on this so that we can constantly be adjusting our parenting for what's going on in the world. Last week, we heard uh, Dr. Cephas mention this thing about passive discipleship, which I'm going to have him teach on sometime, passive versus active discipleship. Sometimes we say, well, I don't know where they learned that. I didn't teach those kids that. Well, no, but you didn't do anything about it either as it grew out of them. 
I don't know where you're getting that from. Well, it's a sin nature, but you're still supposed to prune it out. It's your job. And then we, said, we saw that one of the greatest issues we have is that our kids can often be afraid to bring us things. And kids start off wanting to bring us everything. Look at me, mommy. Look, 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 look. And we have to be careful not to suppress that. Please leave me alone. Please go away. Eventually, they quit bringing you stuff. Now, I get it. We're busy, and we don't want to drop something in the deep fryer while we're making dinner. Honey, could you just wait a minute? Let mommy finish. We have to figure out ways to not crush their God-ordained programming to bring us everything. And what happens, I make this observation. I was telling one of my kids this. I said, there's, there's something strange that happens with parents, sweetie. We go from looking at you as children saying, I can't imagine my life without you. I hope you grow up and buy the house next to us. And then sometimes in the teenage years, you're like, okay, how many months do we have left till you're out of here? Would the U.S. Army come and take you away? I'll call the police. I just can't wait to be done with you. And I said, sweetie, what, what do you think happens between the time they're five and six and the time mom and dad says, I'm done with you? The problem is really not the kids. It's the parenting. The parent has created the monster. Because if the parent would love the child consistently and at a growth trajectory as the kid's growing, the kid will be 17 and 18 and 19 and still want to bring them th things say, hey, mom, look at this. Hey, dad, can dad, look at this. Dad, look what I did. And as long as the dad is feeding that desire for attention, the kid will bring it. But if you start quenching that because you're too busy Facebooking or too busy gaming or too busy watching sports or whatever we do, to make our children feel insignificant, they will stop bringing you stuff and they will begin to go to their friends. And you and I know that's the last thing we want our kids to do. We teach our kids, your friends are stupid. Now that means your kids because our kids' friends are your kids. But I also would help to, you would tell your kids, don't listen to your friends because your friends are stupid. And that would include my kids because they're children. All right. So we, we have to make sure that we don't suppress or crush uh, our kids' desire to bring us things. Even as an adult, I want to show my parents what I do. You know, I'm 47 years old next month, and I still want to show them stuff. But if they're not interested in it, I eventually will stop. Because I don't want to cast pearls in front of people that will trample it. And our kids are the same way. So you have to make time. Give me a moment. Let me finish doing this and then bring it to me. Hold on. Just hold, hold it right there, sweetie. And how about as they grow up, we grow up in our patience too. Because their interests will get bigger and they still want our guiding hand and our approval on everything. But you and I can teach our kids that they're not important to us. And they'll say, well, forget mom and dad. I'm going to Billy. And that can be dangerous. Uh, the other thing, I don't know if we covered it, but my heart's been rolling it around. Um, I make this observation. Children are so full of life, just bubbling with life. But in between bubbling with life and 13, 14 years old, they become many times sullen, stoic, and depressed. And the reasoning for this is that we get irritated with them. We don't take the time to help them with their new emotions. And so they learn not to manifest any of them around us because we're just going to yell at them. Because we are the immature ones who are not mature enough to help them process the new emotions. When they're five years old, they just have like four emotions. And we can manage that. But then they start hitting seven, eight, nine, 10, 11 years old, 12 years old, and jealousy and rage and insecurity and fear and timidity and anger and resentment. All these emotions start coming to the top. And it's our job as parents to teach them how to resolve that. We should be bulletproof enough that they can burp that up on us and we not slap them and say, all right, that is jealousy. That is rage. That's not acceptable in my home. So let's talk about why you feel that way and what we do when we feel that way. But I tell you, if they spout off and they don't know what they're doing because they're a child and this emotion just comes out of nowhere because this, they, have, <coughs> they don't just have bodily growth spurts, they have emotional growth spurts. And just like they shoot up two inches overnight, all of a sudden they have seven new emotions and they're talking like a little adult. You think, where did this come from? Just like, how in the world are you five feet tall already? If we don't take the time to teach them these emotions, probably because we don't know how to cope with them ourselves, we will suppress all joy out of them because they're afraid to even manifest anything. So the reason your teenager is weird is because you are a lazy, immature adult. 
If you can help your kids through all their emotions, say, listen, that's rage. I know that one pretty well. Got to get God to help daddy with that too. This is what we do with it. It's okay that you feel that way. You're probably justified in it, but we can't manifest it in this regard. If you'll teach your kids to bring all their emotions to you and they're comfortable lashing out at home, which is the best place to do it, and you don't lash back, then they'll learn how to temper all their emotions and they won't shut down all of them altogether. You and I acknowledge that kids go from joyful, bubbly, abounding with personality to oppressed emo brats. And it's mom and dad's laziness that does it. We cut them off at the knees because we're too inconvenienced by these things we created. And that's selfish parenting. And what ends up happening is because you absolutely oppress all emotions and they don't know how to safely like just, they're, they're, they're children, they, they have all this bubbling and it just comes out of them. And these are fear or terror or screaming or anger or, or just goofy elation. If we're not big enough to say, this is my child growing, just like they grow with growth pains. My legs hurt, my knees hurt. You don't say, shut up and deal with it. You go in there and you rub their legs you give them medicine and you help them. You say, honey, these are growing pains. Your bones are growing. Sometimes people experience this. It's okay. Let me pray for you. We'll do that with growth pains, but not soulish emotional growth. But then again, maybe we've never been taught this. Maybe we were raised by cavemen ourselves and we were told just to shut up and deal with it. And so now we're adults and we don't know how to handle all these emotions that were in God that he then put in man because we're made in his image and likeness. And rage is part of God, and wrath is part of God, and jealousy is part of God, and so is joy, and anger, and sorrow, and, and elation, and peace. And we have to know how to handle all these, and we have to take time to teach our children. If you don't have time to have children, please don't have any. Children are horribly inconvenient. But when you do it right, they're a perpetual fountain of life that brings you joy and excitement, and you just can't wait to see what God does in them and next. And, and if, it's, if you're right with God and right with your kids, you can't wait to step aside and say, sweetie, God's hands on you. You show me what to do now in this kingdom. God's given you something you never gave me. I'm ready to let you lead me in worship. Or you can lead me to juvenile detention. You and I know, we've said it before, you hold that baby in the delivery room or, you know, in your bathtub, whatever, <laughs> whatever your thing is. Either way, that baby comes out and you realize this is a blank slate with a destiny in Christ. And whatever they become will be 90% my doing. That's a lie. You don't know if you know how statistics work. 90% is the lion's share. Well, we didn't teach them that. I don't know where they got that from. Well, your lack of parenting too. Your lack of parenting also produced that. Uh, so if we're not careful, if we just keep cutting their legs off, they'll resort to just two major ang uh, emotions, fear and anger. Afraid to bring you stuff and always anger and bitter. Those will become the premier emotions. Uh, we also said, and then here in a moment we'll look at some scriptures and then we'll bring the panel back up. One of the questions that was asked last week, where do you say our, see our children are under celebrated? And one of the answers was, it's not so much that they're under celebrated. My mom and dad is that they're nitpicked to death. And it's exhausting to be nitpicked. At some point, you're a parent and you realize, ah, that stuff will kind of work itself out. I understand Hebrews says we had parents after the flesh who disciplined us according to their liking. We gave them honor and did live. How much more should we not submit to the Father's spirits and be blessed? But at some point, they don't want to hear, stand up straight, fix your hair, tuck in your, what was it, U.S. military? Polish your shoes. That, that's, that's exhausting. You know, you got to train them that stuff, train them hygiene, train them how to hold a fork, train them how to tie their shoes, but that's not all they need to hear from you. And it's exhausting to be nitpicked. How about, good job. I love you. I'm proud of you. Let's see how you did that. Oh, that's wonderful. And at the same time, you're teaching them always ask for critique so that they receive your adulation and your praise. And they say, what do you think I could do better? And now they've invited it and it isn't just nitpicking. Well, you know, that's a great picture. Uh, you know, maybe you... I don't know, does the earth, is it shaped like an egg? No, I knew I kind of drew that a little oblong. That's ah, funny, huh? Instead of just always nitpicking them, if the first thing out of your mouth is correction, your kids will hate you. 
If the first thing out of your mouth is correction and constantly, their heart is going to grieve and groan to see you coming. And they'll acknowledge they were happy till they saw your car drive in. If though, and it wasn't always that way, when they were little, you came home, daddy. Now they see your car come in, they go from downstairs to their room to avoid you because they don't want to be nitpicked. And we, our panel discussed some of these questions and I shared it last week that when I was a youth pastor and I taught every six weeks, I would send my tape because we had tapes in those days, send it to Pastor Vaughn. He would, I gave him a couple weeks, I'd call him up, he would critique me. And then my pastor, Pastor Trey would also critique me. Pastor Vaughn was my father in the faith, been in the ministry 20 something years at the time. Pastor Trey was a relatively new minister, but he was also very legalistic. That was one of his weaknesses. So the, the critiques from a seasoned father versus a legalistic, and I might say a little insecure pastor were very different. Same sermon, same young man looking for pastoring and training. And so Pastor Vaughn would say, well, you know, watch out for this. Maybe don't do that. But other than that, man, it was a great sermon. I really enjoyed it. He brought out some great things. It was very general broad. I was looking for correction. He might give me one or two general topic to, to tweak. You know, watch how you address the people. Instead of saying you, 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 say us. He would give me these broad pointers and, and he'd deal with me more about my attitude in the sermon so much as my doctrine or my presentation because he knew that stuff would just kind of work itself out with more practice. But Pastor Trey, on the other hand, every time I sat down with him every six weeks, it was just another list of everything I didn't do perfectly right. And my mind is good enough that I could mentally track that. But in a... I don't want to accuse him of being a sadistic jerk, but every time we met, he would tack on another five to 10 things. So that after a year of six week interval teachings, I had this massive punch list that I mentally tracked with one part of my brain while I prepared a sermon and practiced it to deliver to my church. And we're talking about 45 minute sermon every six weeks. It's not like I'm carrying the burden of the church. It's not like my one message is gonna ruin the people. But before long, I was so crippled by being nitpicked, I didn't want to preach anymore. I love my pastor because I was mature enough to do that, but this is where I was always beat down, so I don't want to do it anymore because evidently I'm no good at it. And after so many, about a year and a half of that, I, I made a trip here to Cookville to talk to Pastor Vaughn about stuff. I was looking at moving to Indy to go to Bible school. And I said, Pastor Vaughn, I, I hate to even say this, but I feel like my pastor might be a little legalistic. He said, well, that's obvious. Wow, okay, I guess my discerner works a little better than I thought. And he said, Chris, he's destroying you. He doesn't mean to, but his critiques of you are legalistic and unnecessary. And he said, and I said, well, pastor, I don't even want to preach anymore. I hate it. I'm so fearful. I, I get sick at my stomach. I prepare a sermon for six weeks. I practice it 150 times. It's, it's a good sermon. And Pastor Vaughn had heard all of them. And I said, and then I just get nitpicked to death and nothing is ever good enough. I won't ask any of our youth if they feel that way because the answer is yes. And I said, I just don't want to do it anymore. And Pastor Vaughn said, well, something's going to have to change. Otherwise, you're going to kill the call of God on your life. He said, either you need to tell him, sit me down, or you need to sit down. But either way, if you keep preaching for him, he's going to absolutely emasculate all your confidence in the pulpit, and you will short circuit the call of God on your life. I said, okay, I can do that. How do I do that? So he told me how to go have a meeting with Pastor Trey and just respectfully, politely say, I'm about to leave for Bible school. Please don't ask me to preach anymore for the last six months. Just let me do my thing. And he said, that way uh, you guys are at least in agreement and you can regain some confidence. And I said, okay. And then Pastor Vaughn said, on top of that, I'm going to be gone in a couple weeks. I want you to come preach for me here. And he said, and I don't care what you preach on. I don't care how bad you mess up. You need some confidence. So that's when he had me come preach here. I think it was 2000 and four was the first time I got to come preach here. I understand what it means to be pit, nitpicked to death and to hate to see the person coming because you know there's going to be nothing good said and you just, my, your heart's saying, what have I done wrong now? Anybody know what I'm talking about? It's exhausting, isn't it? You can't help but hate the person who has nothing but a nitpick to say about you. And it doesn't need to be that way. So that's always, that's shaped me. So even when our young ministers preach, I usually say, well, go back and listen to yourself 
And I, first thing I usually say is go listen to your idiosyncrasies. Count how many times said, you said you know. Really? Yeah. How many times do you think I said you know? At least 400. Seriously? Trust me. Let's work on that. How'd the rest of it go? Awesome. I got no complaints. It's just a delivery issue. You got great doctrine. You love the people. I'm not going to nitpick somebody to death. Nobody can handle that, especially children. If it will destroy a 28, 29 year old man who'd been studying the Bible for 12 years and been preaching and street preaching, if it'll destroy me and beat me down and make me want to throw up before I preach, not out of nerves of the people or disappointing God. I was more afraid of disappointing the pastor Trey than I was God. It's this bondage nobody can maintain. So let's not be nitpicked. So uh, whatever the first verse is, we have these so you can see them. We would turn to them in the Bible, but I think I select the Amplified, just whichever one. Ephesians 6, 4, Amplified. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger. That's rule number one. My mama would always yell at my dad because he would be holding us down, tickling us till we were upset. And she'd say, John, quit provoking the children to anger. That's not what the verse was talking about. That was us being tickled to the point that we were exhausted, tired, and we couldn't beat dad. This is something totally different. Do not exasperate your children to the point of resentment. Another translation points out a shifting standard that's impossible to please. That's being nitpicked to death. I want to also authorize our teenagers in the presence of their parents. You have every right to go and sit down and say, let's talk about what we've been talking about. On the way here tonight, I asked my three children who rode in with me, what are things mommy and daddy do that you like? And what are things mommy and daddy do that you don't like? I want to know. So amazingly, my kids all said the same thing. We like it when you spend time with us. The answer was playing soccer in the backyard, playing G.I. G.I. Joe's, uh, scratching my back at bedtime, reading a book. I like it when we can do rope work in the backyard. I like it when we can go hiking. It was everything. I just, that's, they all said the same thing, but their personalities have a different together time. I said, all right, what don't you like? All, they all said, we don't like it when you spank us. Yeah. <laughs> but Abdi said, but I know you have to because if you don't, the Bible says you don't love us, but I don't like it. I know that when you spank us, it means you love us. I said, well, great. When we get home tonight, I'm going to show you how much I love your little rear end. <laughs> and they all laughed. But the other thing uh, that kind of falls into line here, honey, uh, they, the oldest said, Sometimes you and mommy promise Bud a spanking and then you don't give it to him. And then she said, and I'm just now realizing that as you ask me. I said, all right, fair enough. We can adjust that. Because as you have more kids, you get lazier. Don't let your last kid be your worst grand hurrah. Amen. Often the last kid is the worst because they were raised by the older ones because the parents got lazy. We invest all of our diligence and vigilance in the first kid because we don't know what we're doing. So we're hyper, hyper vigilant. I mean, that kid can't even, can't touch anything. Don't, even, don't lick that. Don't touch that. No. You know, and by the third or fourth kid, you're raising them like clan of the cave bear. It's just whatever. Here's a bag of dirt. Fill it up. <laughs> Eat it. Don't exasperate them to the point of resentment with demands that are trivial or unreasonable, or humiliating, or abusive. It's a pretty powerful amplified version. Don't, don't provoke them with demands that are trivial. I mean, some of you do nitpick your kids to death, and you got to loosen up, because you're afraid of what people will think. And we just think they're kids. They're just kids. They're going to make mistakes. Let them be free to make mistakes in the house of God. Let them be free to really make mistakes at home. It's all replaceable. Let them have joy at home. But trivial, that's an insecure human being who makes trivial demands, unreasonable or humiliating or abusive, nor by showing favoritism or indifference to any of them. For Lydia to say, you guys tell Bud you're going to spank him and then you don't. I just noticed that. That that's, looks like favoritism. We don't mean to do that. Now, he is our only boy, and we love him more than the other two, so it's going to happen. <laughs> Favoritism hurts kids, so, so does indifference. This is also why the word of wisdom says from our friend Pastor Tweed out in Iowa, only have as many kids as the father can father. Yeah. 
not sire. Yeah. King Ahab had 70 sons. How many did he actually father? Only have as many kids as the dad can actually father. Yeah. Not sire, not donate sperm to, but actually disciple and raise. Because yes, you can end up showing favoritism towards two or three. One of the worst dads in the whole Bible was King David. He showed favoritism towards the worst of his sons and indifference towards the best of his sons. I mean, what a fool. Don't show indifference to any of them, but bring them up tenderly with loving kindness in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. That's written to fathers. Fathers, our job is to discipline and instruct them, even our daughters. We ought to understand what a period is what mammary glands are, pubic hair, and we ought to be able to talk to our daughters about this because I want her to bring it to me as uncomfortable as it may make me as an American rather than her girlfriends or some boy online. So it's biology. God made it. I'm married. I understand exactly what happens. Why can't I tell my daughter what's about to happen except that I'm some shallow man who refuses to grow up? Go talk to your mother about that. This says fathers. I'm not comfortable. Get comfortable. You made the kid. And you had to know something about periods to do it. And it's only taboo because we're puritanical to some extremes. God made it. It's fearful. It's wonderful. It's beautiful. We may not understand it, but if God made it, he spoke it into existence and it's creative and amazing. Say, so, honey, you're a woman. This is what's going to start happening. Your body's going to start to produce hormones, and these hormones are going to do this, and it's a crazy thing, and it's a beautiful thing, and then it's going to do this, and, and then this. And the whole time you're like, I am so uncomfortable right now. Why am I using these words? <laughs> Next, what's another verse, Schmitty, we pulled? Fathers, your job is to discipline them. How about Malachi 4, 6? I guess we're working backwards towards Deuteronomy here. This is the preaching of the gospel, the preaching of the spirit of Elijah before the coming of the Lord. It says his preaching. Now, obviously, Elijah's dead. Even in Malachi, he's talking about John the Baptist. But even today's preachers are like Elijah's. We, we bring about revival. We turn people back to God. But preaching should turn the hearts of the fathers to the children. Mothers aren't mentioned here. Neither were mothers mentioned in Ephesians 6. So here, fathers are mentioned. Preaching is supposed to turn the hearts of the fathers toward their children. Parenting falls apart when dads are too inconvenienced. Dads are only inconvenienced because they have no heart for their kids. When you have a heart toward someone, there is no such thing as an inconvenience. Amen. When you no longer have a heart for them, they are a hassle and a burden to you because you'd much rather spend time on your Facebook or Instagram or Twitter. You'd much rather spend time watching sports or playing a video game. That's where your heart is, and that's why your kid's going to hate you. So revival begins by turning the hearts of fathers to their children. If you don't have a dad, I'm sorry. Maybe your mother can be more focused on you. Maybe you get a spiritual father or a mentor who can love you like a dad. But for those of us that are fathers, judgment begins with us. And then the hearts of the children will turn towards the fathers. Well, it's hard for a kid to love a dad that they know doesn't love them. Attitude in the home will be the result of poor parenting. When a dad comes home and all he is is judge, jury, and executioner, there's going to be a rebellious attitude because the kid knows dad's a hypocrite and I'm an inconvenience to him. And that makes that kid hurt. And it's either going to be a timidity and a brokenness or it's going to be an attitude. Amen. Otherwise, the Lord says, I will come and strike the land with a curse. We covered this last week, that any land with broken parenting will have a curse. We see it in our nation. Fatherlessness is rising. 85, 88% of all African Americans are born out of wedlock. And now I think it's 60% of whites are born out of wedlock, 65%. It's creeping up. It's not a black thing. It's not a white thing. It's a sin thing. Here in Cookville, our jail is full of white people, poor white people, poor white people from broken homes because broken homes produce crime. Broken homes produce sinful kids and rebellious kids who hurt. Most of our former criminals in this church are from broken homes with father issues. Like Pastor Vaughn would also say, the only difference between us and them is we never got caught. Amen. Just one decision away from having a criminal record. 
Go to Deuteronomy 6 now, Schmitty. These words which I am commanding you today shall be written on your heart and mind. When it's written on your heart and mind, it's just always there, always there, always there, always there. Paul said you're in our hearts and minds always. You shall teach these words diligently to your children, and pressing God's precepts on their minds and penetrating their hearts with his truths, and shall speak of them when you sit in your house and when you walk on the road and when you lie down and when you get up. That's the dad's job. Mama does it too, but if dads aren't spending time talking to their kids about the things of God, it's going to really come up short for the kids. All right, so that being reviewed, let's go ahead and get our panel up. Give us a moment here as we kind of reset some things. Some of us are done parenting. Some of us have moved into grandparenting mode, and that's okay. These truths will still help you with the next generation of kids. Some of you should be moving into a spiritual mentorship role, maybe with a young mom or a young dad on your job, and you want to be able to give them the wisdom they need when they come to you. They'll come to you with marriage problems, and you can help them with marriage problems, but why not help them with parenting issues? Amen. And then if you've got kids, you want to be able to help your kids when they're husbands and wives. Just you. All right, well, Mr. Vice Mayor, we're so glad that you serve our city. I know we pay you a lot of money to do so here in Cookville. The real money to be made is in Congress. That's where you can get the real money, lobby money. That wouldn't affect your ability to vote at all, would it? No. Not at all. All right. Well, that's sarcasm aside. Let me get my questions here. All right. So one of the things we want to do, again, the Eldridges, they've been our youth leaders for 11 years. There's no such thing as a fool when you've been doing something for 11 years under the anointing of God. And you've seen a lot of kids cycle in and you've recognized that uh, our different classes, by that I mean like this group, they've all had different personalities different strengths, different weaknesses, different obstacles. So we have them up there. Melissa was an educator, still is, has a master's in education. Luke is a psychologist and worked with Plateau Mental Health, and then the homeless ministry and homeless liaison and now does government stuff. So no slouch there. Dr. Crystal is a university professor, so she gets to see Generation Z at its finest. Can't even make eye contact or speak out loud in public at the university level. Have mercy. And then Miss Chantel works at the university as well, and she and Dr. Cephas are our college and career leaders, so they and the Eldridges speak regularly about what we need to do to tweak our youth as they approach college and career. What can we do to help them? So this has been our panel. A lot of these questions we've answered already. So one of the things, um, let me jump into one of these questions here. How... Uh, Let's say this. What elements in a youngster's life help you feel confident that he or she will walk with God for themselves? What elements can you see early in a youngster's life that indicate to you they're going to walk with God? Mr. Luke, I'll let you go first. One thing um, that, we, that, we, that I see regularly is that they come to us and say, do you think this is God or not? Um, and they're concerned about the situ the they're concerned about the, um, their, their avenue in life, the direction they're going to go. College, a lot of them, you know, will come to us, like we said last week. So they'll say, do you think this is right? What do you think about this? Can you judge this for me? So that's good to see. Um, and most of them, you know, you, like some of them will come to us and ask us, you know, what job they should get or whatnot, just for them to come and talk to us about those things. Just to present it. Just to present it. I think that's one of the biggest things for me is to see that they are concerned to make sure they don't miss God. And then it's not a one-time thing. They won't say, do you think this is a college for me? Yeah, I think that, you know, keep walking it out, talk to your parents about it. Well, they bring it back and they bring it, they keep coming back because they want to know that they know that they know that yeah. they know that they're okay with God. So I, I really appreciate that, our kids and see that. Miss Melissa. I would have to say joy when I can see joy on them, yeah. when they continue to present joy. Um, I've talked with the youth before in past years about how I see them joyfully go to children's church. They skip. They're yeah. happy to see their friends. They go in there in the class and you can't get them to stop talking. You know, like they're happy to be there. And then with some youth, you see a switch. Yeah. You know, you might see them as a seventh grader new coming in with that joy, but then 
sometimes as the years continue, that joy just stops. So what do you think, having done this now for 11 years, with 11 years of you cycling through, what causes that joy to plummet or disappear? They can see through our facades. Ah. I think that's what it um, boils down to a lot of times, that they see the world that they thought brought them so much joy that it's not what it was presented to be as. At home? A lot of times it's at home. It can be at school. It can Uh, be friendships that have, you know, let them down even. But, um, yeah, I think a lot of this does stem from home. But it can be just in their normal walk, wherever they're at. So I think when even our oldest and youth that have joy, I'm not as concerned about them. Yeah. You know, they they are pursuing things and, and they're happy. And like he said, they bring things to us. But the ones that don't have joy are usually the ones you find sitting there, not talking to anyone, secluding themselves. So I feel like if they can maintain their joy and they can maintain a relationship yeah. um, with their parents and with leaders, then that will cause them to have a walk with God. So then what can a parent do other than, let's say a parent is observant enough to recognize their personality is changing. What can a parent do at home to help them maintain joy, help them interpret what we're seeing around us? What, what do you think a parent, what do the successful parents do? I think exactly what you were talking about. And when you see those things, don't nitpick them, but spend time with them. You know, your, your kids still have joy because they know that you're going to go play soccer with them or you're going to do these things. I think when you see their joy start to plummet, that's when you, you don't sit them down and have two hour lectures. Oh no. That's when you say, hey, we haven't gone to the movies or hey, I haven't taken you to the park in a while. Why don't we just go? Yeah. Enjoy yourself. Enjoy. Just, and I think sometimes we get so wrapped up in the spiritual and the doctrine and we think we got to put more scripture in them. That's no. not even necessarily no. the case. They just need to see and feel that we love them because we talked about this last week about how they will in spite do the opposite of what we do if they realize that we're false, that we were fake the whole time. They yeah. will do it in spite. Well, yeah. They don't even want to serve God. So let's show them that we love God and we, we want to be a part of their lives and that will help continue that joy in their hearts and in their lives. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. That's a good, that's a good word of wisdom for us. Dr. Crystal, let's read the question again. Uh, I don't even know what it was. What is, I don't even know. Which, oh, what elements in a youngster's life help you feel confident that they will walk with God for themselves. You can see Christians at the university level. So what's, what's helping them? What do you see in them? And then even here, just speak from your experience. What, what traits kind of predict this kid's going to walk with God? I think it's kind of connected to what the Eldridge's, Eldridge's just said in that I can see students who say they're Christians and then I can see students who look like a vibrant walk with God and other kids can be discipled by them. Yeah. And I see that they have what I listed as an independent appreciation for the word of God being true and God being uh, just and God being loving. And they like, have that solid conviction for themselves, which allows them to take their questions to God, allows them not to be afraid, yeah. allows them to know independently that they're loved and not just that I do a church thing. Because students who, who say, you know, and I, I can talk to them once they identify themselves as Christians to me, right? they, and they bring that to me. And so I'll, you know, I ask them things, and you can hear the rhetoric that's just kind of what I do at home with my family. Because when I ask them questions that, you know, they're, what I know of them is not showing that they're lined up with, they, with what they say they believe, it'll often be because they don't actually independently embrace that. Yeah. So they don't have a sense of uh, God being real for themselves. They kind of just walk it through their church culture yeah. or their parents. So away from that, they don't hold on to that. So, so I think they're just that, espousing rhetoric. Yes, sir. Yeah. Without any real, this is the central tenet of my own existence. This is how I'm living my life. Yeah. Because they will disconnect things like, um, I gave an example because my rate, my professor says she tries to make you read. And I teach history, so I do. I try to get them to read, and they don't like that. So I use example. Um, you know, if you are actually reading the scripture for yourself when you come to church, that won't be the first time you heard of David right. in your life, and you have a a ground for listening to the professor um, for the past to the pastor yeah. on a on a higher level than if you would never read the scripture for yourself. So I say, how about if you read before you come to class? That'll help you have a better interaction. And so, 
I was telling that example for a reason, but I lost it. <laughs> so if that comes back, maybe I can share it. Well, uh, <laughs> so what it comes back to, let me, let me dovetail on, off of that and that if, if then they're just, they just have a faith tradition and it's not a walk with God, that may come back to mom and dad represent God to them first and foremost. And if we don't demonstrate the love of God, the justice of God, the mercy of God, then we just become the vind vindiction of God, the vindication, the wrath, and they're going to hate us and hate our God. So, well, yeah, I was raised Christian, but that's not really my thing. That's my mom and dad's thing more than anything. So that comes back to us living it at home so there's no facade. Our, par our kids seeing their parents read their Bible at home, pray at home, repent at home. For some reason, word of faith got really allergic to repentance. For some reason, Word of Faith leaders taught this heresy that says you shouldn't repent to your kids. And that's one of the most apostate things I've ever heard out of the Word of Faith camp. Not everybody, but some prominent names my mind's thinking of. I would never repent to my kid. They're under me. You're a fool and you're going to lose your kids. Kids need to know parents are human. We make mistakes and we owe them apologies. And they want to forgive very quickly. But they, they want to say, they want to hear us say, we're sorry, please forgive us. And if we can't do that, they're going to hate our God because if we don't repent and if we don't tell them we're sorry or they're sorry, we forgive them when they repent, they're, they're going to have this obscure understanding of repentance and forgiveness. And that's a, that's a standard no kid can live up to. So it'll just be a faith tradition. That's the faith of my fathers. It's not mine. We have to pray that our kids become like Jacob and say, the God of my father will become my God. And we've prayed that for our kids, that they, the God of mom and dad would be the God of our children. Do you remember it? Yes, sir. You Hallelujah. Me. <laughs> the, the thing I, did, I thought about was that they are able to have honest inquiry and yeah. see God is really big. Yeah. And I think if parents, if we can point our children to God's love being more than our love, like we love you so much that God loves us so much more. And we have the wisdom that you need because we're parents, but God's wisdom is infinite. Just Amen. always making God something big to pursue. Yeah. And when they have that, they're better able to ask those difficult questions and come to me like, because it's real things like, why are Christians so mean to gay people? And, and how come this thing has happened or that thing? They come and they ask honest things. Their parents just kind of shut down. Yeah. Like God can't answer that. And he's big. And so on a campus where we're there for inquiry, yep. they ought to be able to ask those questions freely and that never have to dismiss who God is. Well, that means the parents have to have a walk with God for themselves. Amen. And stay vibrant in it. I shared last week, one of the things that blesses me about my friend Don Randolph, that's Pastor Barclay's daughter. She's a few years older than me. She absolutely adores her daddy and still looks to him like she was a 10 year old little girl. But it's because Dr. Barclay has consistently grown with God as she has, so she's never outgrown him. If we're not careful, our kids will come to a point, call it critical mass or maybe terminal velocity where they realize they've outgrown us and we're not the great people they thought we were. And that will be a realization for a lot of kids. They realize mom and dad are stagnant and it becomes evident when we say, well, go ask your teacher or go ask pastor or go ask your Sunday school teacher. No, I'm asking you, you're my parent. You don't have to have every answer, but my goodness, in the Google day, just say, give me, give me 20 minutes of prayer, five minutes of Googling, and I'll have an answer for you. <laughs> or I'll go call pastor or one of the elders. Don't fail your kids. Outgrow them. So they have something to always look up to. But when you're a stagnant Christian, your kids will see through the facade. And by the time they're 14 or 15, they'll realize, yeah, we don't live this at home. This house is a house of lies. I wonder if pastors are as big a fraud as my parents are. One of the elders are frauds like my parents are. And before long, your laziness makes the rest of us look bad. And we're not guilty of your sin. We live it at home. Amen. All right, Miss Chantel, uh, what elements in a youngster's life do you feel kind of indicate they're going to walk with God? So in terms of seeing, you know, students come from youth to college and career, and even my own testimony, I think, you know, the same thing that they have said, that zeal for God, by the time they get to college and career, it's either there or it's not. It's not. not. And if it's not there those are the ones that usually are plucked off and, you know, go to the world. And it's enticing. And it's hard when you're raised in church, right? Yeah. Because this is all you know. But if they don't, the ones that um, 
in college and career, we, we intentionally, we don't chase your kids. Yeah. It is different in youth. They have Wednesday nights. They talk to the Eldridges, and it's great. And we want, we will be whatever you want us to be, but we don't chase college and career age. They can chase us, and if they do, and I have some that do, and um, they want to meet, they'll call, they'll talk. And those, we will invest whatever we, we can in, and the others, they're going to go on and do whatever they're going to do. Yeah. And that's not because we don't want to invest in right. them. But that zeal for God, you can't make someone have that. They have to have it for themselves. And I think it's, it's a critical age during youth, when they have to catch that because that's when they are coming into their own and they are making that faith that is their own and either they're like i really kind of don't want this the world and sin is more enticing than yeah. church because you know these people don't judge me but my parents nitpick me to death yeah. you know and that's where that um i think it's pretty much the same thing either having and i think it's kind of zeal and joy are not exactly the same but if you have zeal, you have joy. Yeah. So for what it's worth, I feel like that's, um, that's kind of the thing that you can tell when they are coming into college and career. Those that chase us usually do have that zeal. And as you say, as you talk, I think it's hard to have zeal for God when you're nitpicked to death at home because that's oppression. You're oppressed, you're exhausted, you're always just afraid. The heart is, what have I done wrong now? which means they don't have much faith in their parents' encouragement. What have I done wrong now? And it's hard to think you can please a God who is perfect and righteous when you can't even please a parent who you think would at least relate to your fallacies. So it, it seems that it comes back to the home life. If they're nitpicked to death, browbeat to death at home, they're not going to have they're not gonna have freedom to enjoy God. They're not going to have freedom to grow. They're not going to be zealous. They're going to be just towing the line can't wait to get the heck out of this place and if mom and dad stay at the church I'm not because I'm not going to be here and I hate to see that kids that were birthed into our church would grow up with those kind of attitudes if I can also say this too I think it's it is especially critical for those that are raised in church I was raised in church but my parents stopped serving God when I was in high school a little bit so I had to come into my own I had yeah. to have that moment of this is defining me and I have heard some of our kids that have gone you know to the purity conference or whatever and they come back and they noted that they those other kids from other churches were hungry for God and they recognized that they were missing that in their own life yeah. and I think because of you know legalism and religion and we live in a religious region all of that stuff plays into it, but they have to be hungry for God and they have to have that. I think the nitpicking does really, really kill that. Yeah. Um, I, I was helping uh, a young lady. She had been in several relationships. She was raised in church. And we were trying to, I was trying to help her pinpoint why she was hopping from dude to dude to dude to dude. And they were all totally different flavored dudes. I mean, typically when a girl is kind of boy crazy, she kind of has a vein of guys she likes, football players or the intelligent type or whatever. So I, I was talking with her, we're trying to troubleshoot her life. And I said, all right, so you like this guy. He was like a conservative, he was a jock. What'd you like about him? Well, I could talk to him about anything and he'd just listen. All right. And well, then you hopped over here to this dude. He was like a progressive liberal, you know, was into all this weird politics stuff. Totally opposite than this other guy. What'd you like about him? Well, I could just talk to him and be me around him and he would listen and he didn't agree, but he didn't tear me apart. Okay, well then you hopped over to this dude, which was even further in the weird level. And uh, you know, I didn't even know if he was straight or not. And what'd you like about his relationship with you? Well, he listened. I could just be me around him and he wouldn't tear me down. And then there was a fourth guy, and I said, do you see the common denominator here? You like these guys because they listen to you. And there was a freedom to just say what you were thinking. And even if you didn't agree, it didn't bite your head off, and that's why you like being around them, which to me says in their ho her home life, she didn't get that. Probably nitpicked to death. We don't talk that way. We don't think that way. 
well, why don't you let them finish phrasing the thought and the philosophy? Well, okay, so what do you understand about this philosophy? All right, where do you think that comes from? Have a discussion about it instead of just absolutely cutting them off at the knees so that they're afraid to even communicate any idea. And so consequently, this girl doesn't serve God. She serves people that will show her the attention she never got at home. But I could tell you that in their home, there was a legalism of saying the wrong thing, thinking the wrong way. Of course, we want to police what we say and what we think, but we have to be able to fully look at it before we know whether to shut it down or not. And listen, I, in our home, we have a clean home, but I don't care if my kids want to come and talk to me about gay stuff. That's part of life. They got to understand it. We talk about Islam. We talk about homosexuality, the poison drink. We talk about scandalous things. And I want them to be able to feel free to talk about it. If they learn a new cuss word, what did you learn? And they say it in my home. Okay, well, this is why we don't say that word. I'm not going to bite their head off because I clutch my pearls at the same time. <laughs> Oh, oh, God just fell off his throne because my nine-year-old said the B word. She doesn't even know what it means. That nitpicking. One of our questions on here, we'll, and we'll, we won't forget you, Dr. Cephas, was uh, what, do you, what role do you think living in a religious region has on our kids? And I would answer that straight away by saying it makes our parents religious. So our parents, we're parenting out of fear. We're afraid our kids won't be the perfect specimen of Christianity. We're not. So it's almost like the weird football player or the weird cheerleader who wants to live vicariously. Some of you might be a spiritual honey boo-boo. <laughs> Your modeling days are over, but honey boo-boo can take the torch and the drumstick apparently. Dr. Cephas, what, what aspects do you see in a kid that you can tell is going to serve God? Because um, it all seems to be the same, zeal and joy. But what would you add, if anything? Um, so I think those things are the biggest things, so I'll try to add something different. Um, I think some of it you just hit on, but weaning the kid to be independent. For us, we deal with older, closer to the older age. So if we know that in, you know, 18 is our legal way you become an, an adult officially, and God honors that to an extent, and you know that, and you, you've taught by 13, you know, yeah. and it's been done. So you, you have five years between that. So having the child being more independent as they grow. So if you think of a, a baby born with zero independence, everything has to be done. I mean, every year they gain, they should gain some independence. Yeah. You know, and so by that last few years, if that kid is not independently serving God in a way, which to me, and this is not to promote you, Pastor, but it's just the truth, if you're not transitioning them to having a pastor on their own. Yeah. Because uh, I, I can tell you as a college and career leader for many years, so it, it doesn't matter who that, th those people are, there have been parents who've been upset because that teenager brought me something at that point, they were already 18 anyway. Yeah. Or they brought me something and they wanted to ask or say, hey, do you think I can talk to pastor about this? And the parents get upset. That's setting them up to not, you know, transition them from being, having their own, their own leadership in their, in their life. And so rolling that back, I think that a child being allowed to be curious, yeah. not, just the, not just the Christianese answer, Oh, Buddhists of the devil. Yes, we know that. But why is, is, is being a Christian better than, than walking this way, yeah. right? And allowing them to just be curious and ask those questions. And, and, and be with them in their curiosity. Right. But I think the, the, we shut that down. That's, that's just of the devil. We don't serve that. Well, <laughs> why? Well, yes. I mean, that's not enough. I mean, that's... You, you can tell that to a, a two-year-old or something, but when you're 18 or 17, that's just not enough. Or why do, we, why do these people, and why do they get to get, have get-togethers at their family house with our parents and, and you know, do all these things? And you'll say, well, because we, the Bible says we don't, you know, we don't live riotous. You know, we don't have parties like that. We don't drink and all that. Yeah, but why is that not yeah. profitable? As kids grow up, they're going to continue to ask why. Why? And if we're just as lazy with the 12-year-old as we were with the two-year-old, 
they're going to look for answers elsewhere. And our answer is of just because it's in the Bible. And we don't walk them through the logic of God's doctrine. They're not going to understand. I, I think we all operate better when we have an explanation for why things are one way and not the other, whether it's on your job or with laws. Kid, Bud Bud the other day was asking so many questions. I said, son, why are you ask so many questions? He said, because I want to learn. Fair enough. Next question, son. And we shut it down. We honestly, being in a religious region, I, and it's not just our region, I think we're lazy and we're inconvenienced. We want them to catch what took us 30 years of study. We want them to get it in two years. And we put them down because they don't. But it really fails, that, that kind of behavior and attitude fails to understand what it takes to raise a child. God gives them to us so that they're in our home completely absorbing everything we have if we'll put it in front of them. Think of a kid as a sponge or maybe like a squeeze bottle that is completely depressed in a technical sense, not emotionally. And God bursts them into our life in all of the flavors of our water. And as they grow, that, that container is absorbing everything that is us. And the water that's closest to that spout gets sucked in the first. And if they're absorbing knowledge and all we say is because, 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 and not knowledge and instruction and wisdom and doctrine, they're going to suck in a bunch of hollow answers and it's going to frustrate them. But it buys us time to go back to our Facebook. It buys us time to go back to golf or rock climbing or video gaming or whatever lame thing we're wasting our life on. Instead of saying, well, son, I'm so glad you asked. I'm honored you brought this to me. Let's talk about it. And they may not want as much as you give them, but they'll get something. But at least they know I can take anything to my dad. I can take anything to my mom and they won't condemn me. We teach our kids, judge us. So they're not afraid of being judged, but our kids don't know condemnation because we're going to judge them. That's part of it. Judge me, daddy. Judge me. Hey, listen to this, daddy. What do you think? They want to be judged, but they know we're not going to condemn them. By condemn, we mean nitpick, browbeat, and slander and uh, uh, insult. Cephas. Just one last thing. Yeah. And the second thing is, uh, you know, as parents, we're all human. And so we are going to make mistakes. That just comes with it, right? And, but I think what I usually see is if there is the biggest thing in their life, we'll just say the biggest negative thing in their life, is bigger than the sum of all the good things put together, they're just not going to make it. Like the, whoever you were talking about, having a, an issue with just want people to listen to them. Well, if they grew up in our church, they've had all this doctrine, they've been doing all this stuff, but this particular thing, this particular deficit in their life is much bigger than all, all the, the other things that, whether they've been to, you know, all the training, all the positive things, all the prayer, all the answers prayer. And as us as parents, it's very important that whatever happens, whether it's traumatic or not traumatic, that we make sure that that doesn't become the biggest thing in their life, whether yeah. it's the lack of in this particular case, maybe their parents weren't listening to them, that example that you gave, that became the biggest thing in their life, yeah. bigger than all the good things. And I think we just have to watch for that because we, we are going to make mistakes, but the mistakes cannot be the defining thing in their life. Well, if we will consistently check in with our kids, and by that I mean say, honey, how are you doing? Is there something daddy can do more for you? And, and to be honest and submit yourself to your kids and say, what do you need from me? What am I not giving to you? Now, that doesn't mean you're going to give them, a, if they say a million bucks, you're not going to give them a million bucks. You don't have it to give. But daddy, I need more time with you. Daddy, I just wish you wouldn't like stop me when I, shh, that, that daddy, I wish you wouldn't always interrupt me mid-sentence. Why can't I ever finish a sentence? And not just ask the question, because that can be legalistically, the pastor said to do it, but then to listen to what your kid needs and give it to them. If it's an emotional need, why would you not supply that? If it's time, why would you not supply that? If it's encouragement, why would you not supply that? Why not take interest in the things that interest them? Why not feed the things that interest them so they can grow in it? I don't know what we expected out of parenting. Maybe we just wanted to regurgitate the childhood we complained about. But we got to be a lot more attentive to our kids' needs. We're raising them up in the weirdest day ever. They're going to school with kids who have worse parenting than we are capable of because the kids are identifying as cats and dogs. You know you have daddy issues. Tell me you have daddy issues without telling me you have daddy issues. I identify as a fox. I want to get a nose ring. You have daddy issues. 
I think I'm bi. You have daddy issues. <laughs> We've got to be better than the pagans. Money doesn't buy good parenting. Time with kids does it. Next question. How can church family contribute to helping our youth and our young adults? Dr. C? For one, I think that um, for us younger parents, I think, um, and, the, and the Bible talks about it, especially with the older women or elderly women, to pull younger women aside. And, and I think that in most church cultures, you don't see that a, a lot, the older, and sometimes it's probably we think, well, it's not our place, but if, if as a parent, even if I'm an elder, and you, you know, you've had four kids or one kid and they're grown, and you can say, hey, uh, Cephas, can I, can I say something? I see the way you're saying this to yeah. you know, uh, little Cephas and all that, and I just wanna you know, throw this out there. And I, so that's from the parenting side, yeah. right? And I think it's important that not think, well, you're about to crash and it's going to cost you and I'm not going to say anything. Right. At the very least, take it to pastor and an elder and say, hey, sister so-and-so over here, I see him doing this. I'm not sure how to say this, but I'm bringing it to you. And I think that would tremendously help. Sure. You know, with parents, especially if you've already had parents and they're grown, help the younger parents. Uh, in love. We should add in love because right. in the South, you typically have the women who are qualified to help won't and the busybodies who aren't qualified will because it's a way for them to manifest a fake ministry. <laughs> like, I'm sorry. Uh, I know you know the word, but you have zero experience in all this. And I would much rather hear from a happily married woman and a grandmother of 28 kids, like our friend, uh, who am I thinking of? Chicago, Miss, Miss Debbie Weiss. That woman could stop and rebuke me with a hatchet to my face. And I'd listen to anything she has to say because she raised 12 kids and has like 50 grandkids and loves God and is sweet and as tender as you can imagine. That woman's full of wisdom and experience. But you know, the lady who's been through three divorces and all of her kids hate her, I'm not listening to anything she has to say. There's an issue there. She's a common denominator in that unbalanced equation. So I want to balance it because if we, if we say open season on helping, we'll have a mess I got to fix by Wednesday. So... But you're right. We ought to be able to step in and say, hey, I wouldn't, I wouldn't let your kid talk to you that way. That's going to go bad. We ought to be able to speak up a little bit, especially those that are elders or that are kind of like church moms. You can tell you're kind of a church mom because we call you mama. It's kind of like an unspoken seat of authority. Mama, Eva, Mother Murdoch. Eva, that's more of a provocation for me. But we do love Mother Murdoch. You know, these are ladies who have a gentle, sweet spirit and they want to help and they have experience. So. And then lastly, just yeah. no noticing the kids, basically. Just Say again? Noticing them. Notice the kids. Because you know, sometimes I'll go and I'll be like, man, how did, you're 13 already? I think the last time I saw you was when you were five. That means that I've passed by them many times yep. in, at church and, you know, and I know it's, it's a lot of kids and whatnot. So it doesn't have to be everybody. But just saying hi and just, you know, Encourage them. Yeah, it's Say, just, I love you. Right. Kids will gravitate towards the people that make them feel good, make them feel loved. Miss Chantel, what can the church family do to help with our youth, young adults? So I think um, for me, you know, kind of maybe the opposite side of the ditch is um, what you're saying. Like, don't be critical. Like, don't judge them, especially if, if we have someone who you know is struggling. If you see that they're struggling, don't treat them like, you know their sin, and <laughs> they're better than that. You know, yeah, they're better than that. We know that they have more potential. Love on them. Give yeah. them extra hugs. Tell them how pretty they look. Like, tell them how handsome they look. Tell them, like, hey, you look like you're really doing a good job. You know, whatever it is, just don't be critical. Don't be judging. They don't need another voice like that. No, and, you know, and if you didn't, and I, I, I don't mean this in a, bad way hopefully it doesn't come out bad but if you didn't maybe do the best with your own kids because you were critical maybe be mindful of that in your helping of other families you know or you know quit exporting to... failed goods <laughs> <laughs> just just turn over a new leaf ask the lord to help you but i think that that's one of the things that just extend grace to them and if we have 
you know, church members that we've lost to the world that are maybe college and career age, you know, they did come up and they were plucked away. But if they come back, don't make them feel like the black sheep. Yeah. Love them extra because they need they need that. At least make them feel like, oh, hey, like, okay, everybody is not going to hate me yeah. coming back to the house of God. Because that's a humbling thing. Like, yeah. if you're coming back to the house of God where everyone knows you backslid, this is not a big church, you know, you love can't slip them. in. So glad so, to see you. Yes. Yeah. Just give them a little extra love. Dr. Crystal, anything you want to add? Yes, sir. I, I was thinking about it when you first gave the admonition at the beginning, when you were preaching earlier, how seriously we need to take the charge that even if we are single and unmarried and don't have children. And I remember, like, I was interested in being married once I realized that, oh, yeah, I'm interested in being, I was, I'm a late adult. So when I realized I wanted to be married, I, like, studied about being married a lot. And I didn't think that much about having kids. If you asked me, I'd say, yeah. But I remember having two friends who went through infidelity, two couples that I do before they got married. And I was able to encourage them as a single unmarried person according to the word. And I had both of those husbands say to me that they were th grateful that I was the friend that their wife had in that season. Yeah, amen. Without a husband. Without a without, husband. Without, you know, that experience, I mean, just the blessing of my pa own parents' marriage. But that was because of the word that was in me about that. Amen. And you can be unmarried and be single and be an awesome auntie, uncle. Amen. And don't think that you're not in that conversation because you are part of this body and that is for the kingdom. Amen. So we need to take it to heart that it matters that we pay attention in this kind of sermon, that we study about that and we pray. Right? If I have a booger and you see it, you should tell me. Yes. Right? So I Please. shouldn't see a booger on somebody else's child and be like, well, that's for them. Right? <laughs> I need to say, hey, got some right here. So we need to <laughs> see ourselves as important to helping other people grow. Because I believe we're going to be accountable for that. Yeah. Like, I can see this issue with this child, and I don't pray about it, or I don't say anything, or I don't try to love on them, or I don't reach out to them. I don't believe that that pleases the Lord. So let us know that as a part of the body, we need to contribute to helping each other grow. And our young people need us to do Amen. that. Amen. Can you imagine the encouragement? Maybe mom and dad's nitpicking you to death and you come in and Dr. Crystal says, it's so good to see you. I love it when you come to the altar and worship God. That really blesses me. And they just had their rear end chewed by mom and dad, maybe justified, probably not, knowing our church sometimes, and to have one of the elders to come in and just love on them. And now they look forward to coming to church because every time they see Dr. Crystal, she lights up when she sees them, loves on them, gives them a hug. And it may be 10 years down the road, Dr. Crystal will be the one they go to. That's how we ought to see these kids. Love on them, encourage them. When they, when they show you their Pinewood Derbies, take interest in them because they're looking up to us whether we're realizing it or not. All of our kids are going to pick one or two or three of us to have as a role model. And we'll be talked about 20 years from now. Now, when I was raised in Cookville, we were at this church, and, and there was this sound guy that was always so good to me, and he taught me so much. He didn't have to, but he did, and it really blessed me. We have no idea. Or there was that one elder, never said hi to nobody. I don't even know why pastor had them. I mean, if you said hi to him, they almost had to, like, get a winch to smile at me. Huh. <laughs> Let's not be that kind of elder. Why are you laughing? Luke? What? Wait your turn. <laughs> we all have a reputation. We need to make sure it's a good one. All right, Miss Melissa. Just real quick, I think what Dr. Sifa said was wonderful when he said just notice them. Notice them. I have so many youth that, that don't feel noticed. And then I have a lot of adults that will make comments to me like, why aren't the youth happy? Why don't they smile? Why don't they look up when they're walking? Like, they don't know how to approach them. And I tell them, just say hi to them. Yeah. Just say, hey, I like your dress. Like, I, I don't think we realize as adults at how easy they actually are to talk to. Yes. I think Miss Kylie would say the same, like she was with us a lot. And these, I'll say they're scary, but sometimes youth are, are can be scary. Um, but they really do want you to talk with them. Yeah. They want to be noticed. They want you just smile at them and just make a simple conversation. And even if I can encourage the college and career to notice the youth, yeah. make conversation with them. You know, they look up to yes. not just college and career, but the adults in this room Amen. so much more than what you realize. Amen. They are noticing you and it would be nice if you could notice them in return. And just something simple will go a long way. Yeah, that's a good, a good encouraging word. We're hearing the same thing over and over and over again. Luke, what, what were you laughing about? Nothing? 
No. Oh. <laughs> We're going to keep it. We're going. That's supposed to be a thought. We'll keep it there. <laughs> and we'll cast it down. Do you want to uh, share it with the group? No. Um, <laughs> the first step is to admit you have a problem. It's gone now. <laughs> um, praise the Lord. Been delivered. Um, everything they've said, you know, talking to them, speaking to, to them, you know, the whole time I'm just mindful of Jeff King. He's got four daughters, but he'll talk to Jude. He'll talk to any kid. Yeah, he loves he comes kids. Up to him. Yeah, he does. And he's, he's, not a, he's not Royal Rangers. And he's, the kids love him they and love run him. to him. They do. And, you know, I'm just mindful. The whole time I'm sitting here thinking, Jeff's got probably one of the best things that he, he's just got a grace about. And he just talks to him. Yeah. There's been times that even Jeff's talked to me and said, hey, you need to look up when you're going somewhere, you know, or whatever. You need to focus on <laughs> saying hi to people. But that he is very, he's very accurate yeah. in that. And what they've said is very accurate. Just talk to them. They're, they're not that bad. They're pretty fun to be around. I enjoy it. Um, the kids are very fun. They got a lot of joy and just listen to their quirkiness, listen to their odd things. Hey, listen, I taught your Sunday school this morning and I discovered that this new thing of just random tackling. Yeah. Like that sounds, I'm not old, but I was like, that feels like hurt. That feels like a bruised rib. Our kids randomly tackle each other. Yes. And the youth leader, I, I heard about that. Oh, they had, to, they had to kept, they talked over me. They said, oh, no, Mr. Luke tackled us, and Mr. Luke bruised Gabe, and Mr. Luke put bruises on Serenity. Well, and I tell Jude, I said, Luke, you know old enough to know that hurts. You're old enough to get hurt. That's what I tell my son. What kind of so, wisdom is that? It's great wisdom. Jaden, he had a nice little scab well, he, right Apparently, here. he got See beat it? up quite a bit. Well, he, he loves it. So though. are you saying we should tackle? He, he really does. We should tackle these kids in the hallway? Anytime. Mudman will fix it. Mud. Right, Gary? You fix any sheetrock we damage? That don't make him. Yeah. Go ahead. All right. No, I was asking. You were, you were the one thinking out loud. Yeah, I don't need to. So just notice them. Yeah, just notice them. I mean, talk to them. Not just, hey, but really have a conversation with yeah. them. Yeah. It won't go long on some of them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, but, you know, it'll be all right. And you'll get out of there and you'll be like, all right, I did good. All right, let's do a final question here. Pastor. What? You already talked. Did you remember something you forgot from last week? Pastor, no, sir. Oh. <laughs> yes. it, it was for this one, ma'am. Okay, yes, you mad something. We can encourage parents, too. Oh, yeah. And help people with their baby bags and baskets uh -huh. and opening the door. And that's, that's kind, too. Yes, ma'am. Helping parents. Let's do that, because people are really nice to you when you're pregnant. All kind of doors and baskets, but after the baby, not so much. So how about we warm up to that? And we show no signs of stopping with the baby thing, so we ought to be really good at seeing a pregnant lady or a new deli newly delivered lady with an arm and a bag and her husband somewhere you know, in the car still drinking coffee, listening to NPR or something. <laughs> doesn't matter where you go in the world it's always the same she's doing everything and then he's going to have want dinner when they get home and she's going to have to fix that too but you're right we could at least help them and teach that man what chivalry looks like or even how to spell it last question what are some suggestions for how families might begin to address some of these topics at home so we've covered a lot of stuff the last two weeks of this service and last service and we've peeled back some scabs there might be some regret I don't ever think you're too old to repent to your kids, to say, you know, I, I was a little more career minded when you were at home and I regret that. That would go a long way. Or to say, you know what, I really got busy chasing whatever your hobby was and I didn't include you or you had a career or hobby and I was at hardly ever at any of your games and I regret that I'd give anything to have those days again. That would go a long way to rekindling and restoring a relationship with your children. I, I am mindful there are some parents who have a horrible relationship with their grown kids and they're fine with that. That's just where it's at. They don't, I haven't talked to my, I talk to my kid every two years. Works for me. That may not be you. Some of the things you can do is apologize. Parents are wrong. They're not all wrong all the time, but there is enough wrong to necessitate an apology. Your kids will love you and respect you more if you could admit, I was wrong. And honestly, it might take some long-term pressure off your kid for your kid to go, I thought, I thought that, but I felt like you always made me feel like I was the failure. And you've ended up crippled their soul and their confidence because you were too prideful to say, daddy was wrong. 
So there may be some discussions that need to take place, but what are some ways, Mr. Luke, we can begin to address these topics at home? I think some of it happened last week, but talk to them. But, you know, I talked to the youth Wednesday night and asked them some questions after what, what we discussed Sunday night. One thing is, is when the kids are talking, don't interrupt them in the middle and say, well, and put your story in on it. Yeah. Try to fix it. Just let them talk. Don't let them preach go all to the way either. through. You know, well, this is how mom and dad, well, they, well, because sometimes what we do is we want to finish that sentence. We want to finish that because we've been there before or we've been through that. But a lot of these kids just want to be able to Express. tell you how they feel and go, you know, and go on and say, all right, well, let's work on that. But don't stop them in the middle of what they're talking about to answer the question, like you said earlier, because you got to let them get it all out. You got to let them, because you may actually miss what they're trying to say because you think you, we know where they're going with it. And just let them, let them all the way through. Let them have that openness, like Pastor has said before. You know, he allows everybody to swing on them once. In a sense, let your kid yeah. swing on you once. One time I was watching football. This poor Jude was interested in it. And um, he stood in front of the TV and said, Dad, you, you, you spend more time with that. You watch that football game when you spend time with me. And I was like, well, sit down here and watch it. No. I was like, you're right. <laughs> so if you get out of my way, I want to watch it. But he was absolutely right. I yeah. let him do that. He, yeah. I didn't get on to him. I was like, ah, you're right. So we turned it off and we went and did something, but allow them to do that. Allow them to have that opportunity because it might be God trying to help you out. So. Yeah, out of the mouth of babes. You say that and I think about cognitive therapy and reparative therapy that psychologists practice and people are able to be set free from horrific trauma when they are allowed to talk about it. Now, most of our kids don't have any horrific trauma, but we still have a tendency of forcing them to bottle it up because we don't let them vent, we don't let them talk, we don't let them express. And how will they know how to do things if they can't do it and fail? We're expecting perfection out of them and because I said so. And that's not good enough for them. So I'm, as you're talking about letting your kids finish their sentences and uh, our, my friend, Dr. Mikolos, who's a, He's a psychologist and a licensed psychologist. He has a practice in Canada. One of the things he specializes in is this psychotherapy method called EMDR, which has to do with eye movement. And he uses it with PTSD and trauma. And basically, he may correct me and call me, or maybe some of you correct me, but the concept is somebody's going through trauma and they want to resolve it. And the psychologist is there and he uses a thing to get them to just follow something with their eyes. And my understanding is just by getting them to follow something with their eyes, it kind of distracts them because they're having to focus on this little light. Sometimes it's just a finger moving back and forth. And the psychologist is then, then asking them questions. The psychologist is taking interest in their life. So tell me, you were deployed in Iraq. Yeah. What was your battalion? Where were you stationed? And they just start answering questions. Was it tough? Yeah. Were you afraid for your life? Almost every day. Did you ever suffer anything horrific? And then all of a sudden they break down and start sobbing. And it's something they've bottled up and they've been so expected to just hold their junk together that now the psychologist has been able to break that thing so they can now share. And he'll talk about, and I've watched, he sent me videos to watch on it, that they'll just start answering questions. Yeah, my, my best friend from basic, Billy, he, we were blown up. I lived, he lost his legs, then he, he died later, and I felt guilty ever since. And they just start sobbing uncontrollably. Now, that's, that's an extreme example, but it's the evidence or the example. The point is, they're paying money for a psychologist to help them talk through things. We're forbidding our kids from doing it. And they're just trying to process their day or their emotions or the jealousy we're invoking in them by favoring their brother or sister. So psychologists have had to pioneer this to help broken people in adulthood when if we were just decent parents, they would always come and be able to safely puke in us. And we were mature enough to handle it and say, well, let's talk about that. Why do you want to punch that person? What's that going to accomplish. Shouldn't we rather maybe do something instead? What should we do instead? I know I should pray for them. Well, okay. How about you punch that pillow and then we pray for little Timmy? No, shut up. Grow up. I don't want to hear that. We're better than that. 
We're McMichaels. We don't cry. Deal with it, son. You know what you're taught. Quit disappointing me and your mother in our church. And that kid's going to say, I tell you what, not going to tell them a dang thing the rest of my life. And it's taken us 300 years of psychology to fix bad parenting. When the kids had a natural line on it in the first place. Daddy, look. Daddy, can I talk to you? Mommy, can I tell you? Mommy, I have a question. Mommy, I'm scared. Get over fear. We're not afraid in this house. God's not giving us a spirit of fear. That's stupid. Well, why are you afraid? I mean, just being some kind of like religious word of fake freak and quoting a thousand scriptures rather than helping them process. Why are we afraid? Bud Bud's been struggling with the dark a little bit. And I love my, my wife doing homeschool work. She said, the Bible says God made the darkness. We don't have to be afraid of it, sweetie. God made it. The Bible says God dwells in the darkness. So what is there to be afraid of? God made it. He dwells in it. You're going to sleep in it. The angels are in there. And to see her use logic as he vents rather than being some kind of hard-nosed word of faith, you know, apostle, prophet, right reverend preacher, you know, when you have more titles than Jesus does, you're a nut. <laughs> There's nothing to be afraid of here. What are we afraid of? And then you give them scripture. So I like it. Let them finish. Let them finish. They should not be afraid to bring you anything. They should be able to feel safe to puke on you any frustration, any fear, any offense and accusation they have against you. Because they're kids. They're trying to learn all this. And if it can't be done safely in your house, maybe they were born in the wrong house, which is not the case. But that's why we're talking about this and growing up. Sorry, I went back and forth. But we do teach our kids, all of us, we teach our kids how when you have issue with somebody, you take it to them. But when it comes to us, you, you shouldn't do that. No. Don't yeah. bring it to me. Don't bring you. Who are you? Who are you? Yep. Mind who you are, but boy. That's what we want them to be. We want them to be that independent when they get it on. They want, we want them to be that. So we got to allow them to do it at home. So if they can do it at home, they have the confidence and they have the know-all. Because you're going, in that moment, you can guide and teach them how to bring it. All right. that You made a good point. Don't see how. You shouldn't say it this way. But, you know, you can guide them through it. But do let them finish. Because one thing I was going to say earlier is, this is not you time. This is them time. It's them time. This is for them to talk with you. It ain't about you, us as parents. I won't say you, say us, but it's about us. It's about them. It's not about us. And let them talk, and then we help navigate that versus, well, this is what I did. When I, no, navigate that time. Don't worry about, don't bring up your glory days or your unglory days, your holy or unholy. Just focus on that at that moment. Yeah. Miss Melissa. What was the exact? Um, why do you love being married to Mr. Luke? How long do we have? You won the lottery ticket. You found it in the parking lot at Tech, didn't you? Walmart. Photoshop, wasn't it? Uh-huh. Did he slip a little card in there and say, hey, how you doing? What's your number? So you in the habit of like picking up guys at Walmart? No, sir. Just once? <laughs> How are some, or what are some suggestions for how families might begin to address some of these topics at home? Okay, so um, I think your youth, I'll speak for the youth, are ready to talk now. Yeah. So um, we asked them if they had good conversations after last Sunday. We got some thumbs up, yeah, you know, kind of iffies. So if I could encourage you to do something kind of legalistic is make a list. Sit down with them, maybe not tonight if it's going to be too long, you know, to talk about this. But like he said, don't interrupt them and make a list of the things that they are bringing to yes. you. Yes. Don't try to fix it. Nope. Don't try to give them scripture. Just make a list of, of all the areas that they're bringing to you. Crazy, good, whatever they are. And then you and your wife make a game plan. You know, maybe even give it a little time where y'all are praying about it, where you talk about it and come up with a game plan on how things are gonna get better. Because I think we all have good intentions as a parent right now in this service right, right now, now we're all the envisioning anointing. the changes we're going to make but two weeks from now we're not even going to remember this service that's our reputation as yes, a church sir. We, we we walk softly for two weeks and then we go back to being lame -o. yes sir so that was going to be my kind of if we as parents could do this make this list and for a month we pick a date as a family to meet and talk once or twice a week Amen. and we just do it and we show them that we are following through 
we're discussing it with them. We talk about the issues. How do you think this is going? Do you think this is getting better? And let the youth have these real talks with Amen. you. Um, because, again, we can't just keep, they can't keep bringing things to us. And we do nothing. And we do nothing with it. That's. Yeah, it's, it strips hope. They want, they want, yes. Um, a lot of us are good, are good at listening, but we're not as great at following through. But also, have mercy on them. I feel like some of our youth feel um, that they get beat up, but they have these issues in their life because they've learned it from us. And we get away with it every day, and you make them feel like failures when they do it. I'm, that might have been a little harsh. I'm sorry. But I'm just, I'm just throwing that out there say so you again. guys realize. I don't we really need to again. show them mercy with their mistakes and their downfalls right now. Because they are watching you as parents have those same issues and same downfalls, and you get away with it and, yeah, daily. Daily. Something this man has said to me a while back has been say it was, you know, at least three or 400 years ago, because it wasn't recent, just so you know, I've grown. But I was getting on the kids for attitude, and I was in a funk. So this has been at least, you know, nine years ago. <laughs> but she said, honey, I think it's hypocritical that you expect our daughter to change her attitude instantly when you've been in a funk for three days. And there's nothing you can say to that, but just keep your head down and say, hmm. And on the inside, you're like, yes, I know she is so right, but that's not the point of the funk. The point of the funk is to make everybody as miserable as hell. <laughs> but, and if you don't mind me adding, I think I, even as husband and wife, a lot of us in this room don't have that relationship where we can just talk it out with each other. So I would, honestly. Well, that's what happens when you get a guy from Walmart. Because <laughs> they are taught how to like roll back prices and be friendly. But if I could encourage you truly, that is what has saved our marriage many times, is that we talk it out. We just tell each other the way it is. He doesn't blow up on me. I don't blow up on him. And we make plans on how to fix Amen. it. So just to throw that out there, as husband and wives, you are probably going to get a little offended at each other because sure. you're going to see that this issue in your child is his fault. Yep. That's her fault. Yep. But you have also got to be willing to just talk and your marriage will be blessed because yep. of it if you'll just hear each other out and be able to have those tough conversations together. Go through that punch list and, and judge it back and forth as a parent. Say, you know, our daughter's right. You do this. There's two witnesses right there, Dad. Are you know right? What? Our son's right. You do this, Mama. There's two witnesses. And be able to have these raw discussions because that's where humility brings the grace. If, if we are just so hell-bent to be right, we're not going to have any change. And the thing I wrote, I see with some of our young people, not just the ones now, but this is a common attitude. Our, our, our youth, youth in general, will get to a place where they have a better hope of getting out of the house than they do for their parents actually changing. They have given up hope that their parents will be what they need them to be. So they just say, I just can't wait to get out of here. Many a kid has walked that out and said, they, they just come home, they, just two more years, just one more year, just six more months, and they just deal with it. They just deal with dad and his attitude and mom and her shrinking. They, they compartmentalize, they dissociate. Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. Yes, sir. So they're compliant kids, but their heart is already laying the groundwork for escape because they have more hope of leaving than they do mom and dad being human beings. That should not be our testimony. We should teach our kids how to change and how to grow, how to repent, how to improve, and it should never stop. We should not be spitting images of our own parents. We should be better. All right. Sorry, but she did, all joking aside, we do have a really good marriage. She does really good. She can talk to me and correct, bring stuff to me. But dads, it is, we're the leaders. It is up to us to make these changes. It really is because we are the head. And this, it stops with us. It starts with us. And, but we do, we have a, we do, we have a great marriage. She brings a lot to me and tells me, you need to, I need you to do this. I need this from you. But, and then you do it. I do it. And then you, and then she's even good at the whole, it's two weeks. She, she helps with, don't freak, don't get in that two week cycle. Don't get in that two week fun. Amen. But she's really good at that. And that's what all of us do need men. We all need that in our life. But as men, we've got to, and dads, we've got to make sure that Whatever our wife brings to, we need that list too. That not the do list, not the honey do list, but the list of make sure 
it, you've got to have that list with your kids, and you, like she was talking about, and we stay on top of it and don't expect mom yeah. to stay on top. Because it, it's not mom. She does have the grace, but God gave those kids to us too. Amen. And all those scriptures are commanded to the husbands. And, and all, every, about everything is commanded to the husband. You get a break. But no. <laughs> Make me a sandwich. I'll go fix it all. <laughs> yeah. Dr. Crystal, let's move on here because we've got to wrap this thing up. Yes, what are some suggestions for how families might begin to address some of these topics at home? I say, first of all, appreciate that we had this panel. And I thank you, Pastor, for saying yes. And it's been so very helpful to Amen. me and to so many of us. And I thought about the fact that you, it's okay not to answer right away. And then yeah. Ms. Melissa put it so beautifully with making the game plan. So you don't have to answer right away. You can wait and, and write it all out. And as, you, as we do that, let's remember to keep a good attitude. Because when you, we, people say, oh, she's got an attitude. And attitude is a personal problem. Yep. It means something is going on with you. So if you have an attitude with me, or I see you with your attitude as we're interacting, but you don't communicate to me what's going on with you, you can say, girl, I got a headache. I'm sorry. Don't mind me. Right. But if you don't communicate that to me as a child, I should not have to try to interpret what's going on with my parents. Right. That that's not fair to them. It's Amen. torturous, actually, Amen. for me to tell you what's going on with me. You keep your attitude and you just be staying. Sorry, Miss Melissa, but you're right here. You just keep your attitude. And I don't know. I think I have to then think about what I did. Or are Vain they still mad at me? Yes. And so we can allow our kids not to have that if we would. Um, maintain a positive attitude while we're working out our stuff and just really a prayerful humble attitude to say lord help me handle this that's good so i hope i'm sure everyone is thinking this but even as we are sitting on the stage like i have a list of things that you know i'm currently getting the victory over and i'm thinking god help me like help me there are so many changes that i need to make that we are trying to make but um just for what it's worth <laughs> we're not perfect up here um but I guess to address um, the question, I think the first thing um, is to just apologize. Yes. It doesn't matter how old your kids are. As a 30-something-year-old woman, um, I there are things, my parents are not together, and so there are things that happen that still hurt me. Yeah. And you know what? I just have to get over it yeah. and move on with Jesus. Amen. But if the parent that has hurt me would apologize for that, do yeah. you know how far? It would go so far. How far that would go? I am in my 30s with children. And, and it that still hurts. apology, it does. It hurts. And um, so that is the first thing. It doesn't matter how long it's been. It doesn't matter how whatever an apology goes so far in restoring things. And then the second thing is, Sometimes, and I don't know, like all of these things are amazing, but if God is telling you to get the victory over something in your life, get the victory. Amen. Because you modeling yep. the victory. Yep. It does not matter what it is. If that is going to, in turn, help your children, adult children, and children in your house see that, like, look at my parents. Like, they're, they're making still, changes. They're, still they're moving with God. And so they're going to see that behavior modeled in front of them. And that is going to go so long. I mean, you may not even have to sit down and have a conversation. They're just going to see that my parents getting after it. They're getting the victory Amen. and things are getting better. They walk you with know? God. This yes. is a real God home. Yeah. So just modeling that and apologizing, Amen. I think. Um, Amen. That's good. Dr. Cephas. That's my read the scripture. Sorry. May I read the scripture? Yes, please do. Uh, this is 1 Peter 3, 7. We know this scripture well. Likewise, ye husbands, dwell with them, your wives, according to knowledge, giving honor unto them, the wife, as the weaker vessel, as, and as being heirs together of the grace of life. And I think that this kind of ties all of it together. There is a connection there with dwelling and intelligent yeah. recognition. And in this context, it's talking about husband and wife, but it does go for parent yeah. and children. Yeah. That if you're going to dwell with any person, you have to have intelligent recognition, knowing them, and not just them, but knowing yourself. Because we parent out of our personality. So if I know my personality is, if we get in a conversation, I'm going to dominate the conversation. Well, that's an intelligent recognition that I need to 
prep for that, yeah. to hedge that. So does that mean for this conversation to have your, with your kids, if you have that personality, maybe have them write a letter. Maybe you write a letter. Yep. So just understanding and making those adjustments where it needs to, to make because we are commanded to dwell with any person that we dwell with with intelligent recognition or knowledge. And we'll be fools to just know this is the way I am, this is my default mode, and not do anything to hedge that, yeah. to, 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 to change that. So it could be that for you, maybe, you know, these, I, I think this would be on YouTube, Mr. Luke, I don't know. Uh, yeah, so if it is, maybe watch it again. Maybe have your, watch it with your kids. If, you know, that, that works for them. If it doesn't work for them, maybe whatever it is, you have to know that kid and yeah. know yourself to make sure that it happens. If I know that if we talk, I'm going to interrupt, 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 then I have to figure out a way going into that conversation not to do that. Well, maybe my kid is not, I don't know, confident in expressing themselves. Hey, son, daughter, could you, could, you write, could you write it down? Could you write a letter before we sit down? So just understanding that. And it, the last part says, um, with intelligent recognition, or according to knowledge, giving honor to the wife. But in this case, we're saying giving honor to the, to the, to the kid. And as you've taught, honor is just highly esteem the value yeah. you place in that yeah so without dwelling with our children with with that intelligent recognition we are not placing the high value on them as children as they need to be the kids can tell when we're put out with them kids can tell when we're inconvenienced by them and the devil can as well and he'll talk to them and say should, you should have never been born your parents even think you should have never been born. look at how they look at you look at how they're too busy for you why did they even have you this is how kids start having these thoughts if you let me say it this way. Familiar spirits will visit all of our kids and they'll, they will watch our kids and see what they're battling and feed them lies. And our job is to make sure our houses are clean, that there's no room for vain imaginations, there's no room for inferiority complexes, that it's a house of love, a house where things can be communicated, even fears, even anger, even resentment. Kids ought to be able to look at you once in a while and say, Daddy, you're a hypocrite. And you not just backhand them into next month. Because if your kid doesn't usually say that and all of a sudden they know that word and they want to apply it to you, you might learn something if you say, please explain that. Choose your words wisely, but let's hear what you have to say. Because it may be out of the mouth of babes, you just get smitten by God. But the fact that my kid would be bold enough to tell me that, what's wrong with your ego? You can't handle that? I'm sorry, your dad was a failure, but that doesn't mean you got to follow in his footsteps. Now, if your kid calls you a hypocrite every day, obviously there's a problem. But if they've never told you that and they just rupture one day and they say, I just think you're a hypocrite. Well, let's hear them out. If they're wrong, what's that to you? Just help them with it. But one thing I would add with everything everybody said, which is tremendous wisdom, and hopefully if this teaching applies to you, you're writing it down. I would say once you have this list, and you and mom or you and dad talk about it and discuss it and you judge it and you come up with a game plan, I, I would give the formula or the prescription that you sit down with your kids and you pray about this every day. Yeah. Have a little prayer meeting, which you ought to be doing anyway with your family and say, kids, we're going to start praying. And I'm your dad and this is your mother. You need to be praying for us because we're not perfect and we need prayers. And we acknowledge, you're right, we don't do this, and we do that, and we don't do this, and we're going to make changes, but we're going to pray about this every day. For how long? Till it changes. Amen. And that will demonstrate to your kids you mean business. You will have to put Facebook down. Amen. You will have to turn TV off. You will have to be more disciplined with your time, but it's going to be worth the investment if you, if you save your kids and your relationship with them. So don't just make the list. You know, these are all steps that take incremental humility, but also discipline to follow through. But once we have a list, we can't fix it without prayer. And you might even learn something by hearing how your kids pray for you. Father, please don't let my daddy hurt me anymore with his words. And there might be an honesty that comes out of them as they talk to Jesus that they're afraid to even give you. Please don't let mommy and daddy yell like they do, like I hear them in their bedroom at night. Jesus, please bring peace. Please don't let my mommy leave my daddy like I overheard her say at breakfast one time. You have no idea it would come out if there was freedom in your home. 
do not forget your children are children of God too. They are your brother and sister in Christ. It's a unique relationship for the season that it is, but they're still human beings. They're creations of God. They're his kids because they're born again. They're your brothers and sisters because we're one family, but they're also your children. And somehow we got this redneck Southern mentality that, you know, you're just another work mule for the field. So you'll do what I tell you. In which case, shoot me now because I don't want to be used by you. We have to be more compassionate than this and make whatever adjustments the Lord's dealing with us on. So I think we've covered a lot. Um, if you can go back and listen to these last two panels and let the Lord speak to you. I think we have plenty of action items on how we can be better parents. We have to constantly adapt because of the day that we're living in. But uh, go that Malachi 4 verse. This is the one we concluded with last week. No matter what the age, no matter what the sin, no matter what the technology, this is the root. The fathers must have a heart for their children. If there's no father in the picture, the mothers must have a heart for their children. If you don't, there's no guarantee your children will have a heart for you. And that's what we're facing. So whatever we do, whatever the problem we're facing is, it's going to be solved by spending time with your kids, letting them talk, praying with them, repenting to them, coming up with a game plan, following through. Don't practice the CCF EWC two-week repentance program. That's like a New Year's resolution for pagans. Some of us, our church's reputation is we repent like people lose weight at New Year's for two weeks. And then we're back to whatever sin God was angry at. But boy, we can walk softly like Ahab for two weeks. Boy, I can repent to my kids for two weeks and then I'm back to where I am. Let's make these changes. Implement it. Put it on the refrigerator. And as a family, go through life together. They will respect you more. Respect is not demanded. It's earned. And our kids think we hung the moon till they realize we didn't. Let's not disappoint them. And our humility will mean more to them in the future. Amen? Has this helped us? Yes, you got something to go home and act on even if you don't have kids? Hopefully, pray for the rest of us. Amen. Pray for all the... We have uh, 90... Where's AJ? 98 kids? 95 kids under 18 in our church. It's a lot of kids. I would say the heaviest end of that's probably under 13. That's where the bulk of it is. I would say, how many youth do we have? 15. So then we have 80 kids under 13. It's a lot of children that we're responsible for. So we need to make sure we don't fail our God and raise up demon possessed hooligans. The dangerous thing is we're teaching them our lingo. But do they catch our heart? We want to make sure they find our God and they serve him. Why don't we stand to our feet? You guys can go sit down. Father, I thank you for tonight. Thank you for helping us. Father, this has been a different kind of Sunday nights for us, but you've blessed us with so many babies. You've answered so many prayers, opened so many wombs, caused so many adoptions. Families have had their children, and, and at the same time, parenting is a lot more than just conceiving. It's a lot more than just breastfeeding and weaning. Parenting is a work that we've got to do from the time they come home with us to the time we turn them over to their career and they leave home. Father, I pray that the Word of God has convicted us where we need convicting, tweaked us where we need tweaking, put a plan, an action plan in us where we lacked any kind of plan. And Father, now I pray your grace upon us that we would follow through indefinitely. May it change our homes. May change begin tonight. May we begin the journey of a thousand steps with a prayer meeting tonight, a come to Jesus meeting tonight, a mom and dad on trial and the children are the witnesses and they're able to testify freely. And we have the humility and the open ears and heart to hear them that we might do better by our kids. They are human beings. They have emotions, personalities, needs, wants. They're children of God. And we're responsible for them. Father, forgive us for our, neg our negligence. Forgive us, Father, for our pride. Forgive us for laziness. Forgive us, Lord, for our fear. We love our kids. We just need help knowing how to love them and what that looks like. May our kids go up, grow and go better and further than we. 
We pray that these children catch our heart, they build upon our foundation, and they do greater things for God than we ever could. May these children outgrow us, outlive us. May they outperform us, outlove God, outserve God, outstudy your word, outpreach your gospel. Father, thank you for trusting us with all these kids and grandkids, for all these babies in our church and all these toddlers and little ones and youth. Father, bless them, help them. May our youth be able to forgive us. May our children be quick to forgive us. May we realize how powerful a I'm sorry, daddy has changes to make. May we realize how far that'll go. Help us, Lord, help us in this church to be generational in our thinking. May we not live for the weekend. May we invest daily in our kids so they might become disciples of our God. Help us, O oh Lord, we pray. And let's pray this together. Father, in Jesus' name, thank you for children. May we present to you godly seed. Grace us to parent. Grace us to grandparent. Grace us to repent and to apologize and to change. Forgive us, Lord. Have mercy on us. You love these children more than we do. May we learn that love and may we be active with it. Restore my children to me, Lord. Turn my heart greater towards them. And may I glorify you with their lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, it's about 8.30. We'll be back.